We thank you, Lord, for this morning of worship and praise. We pray that, again, send your spirit now into our hearts. Open our minds to hear your word and the message that you have for us today, a message of understanding, knowing who we are and whose, whose we are. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, last week, we, we looked at how the mercy of God not only made an impact on the life of Joseph, but this same mercy was at work in the hearts of his brothers. And these interactions led the way for forgiveness to bring about a marvelous reconciliation. A relationship that had been broken for years was restored. And I mentioned at the close of my message a reference to the beautiful and moving gesture of love shown by Joseph for his brothers. And we just heard that read this morning that he said that he, well, I'm sure he hugged them, but he kissed them and um, put his arms around them and just shared his love with them and them with him. What a beautiful picture of, of true reconciliation that was accomplished because Joseph was able to forgive. And we also have seen how Joseph purposely, purposefully kept his identity hidden from his brothers. He wanted to test the waters first. Isn't it true that our life experiences teach us these valuable lessons concerning relationships, especially when trust has been broken? Finally, Joseph could not contain himself any longer, as we heard in the, in the lesson for today. Um, and it said he just, he had to reveal, he finally looked at them and said, I am Joseph, your brother, and whom you sold into slavery. So he had waited a long time to reveal his true identity. And as I thought about that word, the scripture we heard that they use is dismayed. And I think that's a good word to describe their reaction. To simply say surprise would not capture the shockwave that must have hit them when they heard of his identity. So now Joseph proceeds to explain to his brothers how God had an incredible plan all along for Joseph's life, far beyond all imagining, beyond imagining. And one thing that struck me when rereading this passage is a statement that expresses a generosity of spirit that is rarely given. Do not be angry, Joseph said, with yourselves because you sold me here. And when I thought about that, I thought what a tender, loving heart Joseph possessed. The gift of forgiveness in itself was an act of merciful kindness. But in addition, Joseph was concerned that they need not hang on to any sense of regret or self-condemnation. And I'm reminded of, I think it's in 1 John, it says uh, that that if our hearts condemn us, God does not condemn us. It's a loose translation, <laughs> but I always draw a comfort that because I think we all deal with that. We all struggle with that at times, that sense of self-condemnation. Oh my gosh, look what I've done now. But God doesn't condemn us and certainly, and Jesus doesn't. Sure, we grieve his heart, we grieve God's heart, but never do we receive condemnation from him. And as I was preparing this message for today and reflecting on the question of identity, that's the central theme we're looking at, Joseph's identity was revealed. But I'd like us to look also at the, the bigger picture. The important point I want to make is what impact does it have to know our true identity in Christ as his disciples? And especially as beloved children of God. Uh, and so as I was thinking about this, uh, I kept thinking, you know, maybe I should share just a bit, a little tiny parcel of my story, of my conversion, and a little bit of my life, and what, what changed my identity, and made me who I am today. So I'm going to do this uh, very briefly, when I really discovered for the, for the first time that, yeah, I'm a child of God. That really hit home to me. And I'll just kind of share briefly what, what led up to that, and then gave my life new meaning and purpose. Well, I was fortunate to have been raised with a dad and a mom who I knew loved me, and I was blessed with an older brother whom I remained friends with. We were friends all of our lives. 
Um, and in hindsight, I now realize that my essential identity as a beloved son was kind of like a seed planted in my early, I think all of us, if we had a loving home, it's like a seed, right? That God has been planted in our hearts or in our souls. That hopefully we realize that as we grow older and, and, and appreciate that. The other thing is receiving the sacrament of holy baptism, which I did at around 18 months, I think, um, by the grace of God, the life of the spirit was indelibly united with my spirit. And this is what the church has believed from the very beginning, from the teaching of Christ and the apostles in the first centuries, that through, this, through the baptism, the life-giving waters of baptism and receiving the Holy Spirit, we are made a child of God. Not like other, not unlike other younger children, about the time of entering kindergarten or first grade, I realized there was a real tendency in me towards shyness. And as a result of that, all through school, I always judged myself as not as quite as confident as my peers. Um, and I struggled truly to belong. And that was difficult. I think that's pretty common in many ways. For many of us, this reality of what we call low self self esteem really plagued me big time until about the age of 21. Okay, fast forward to age 15. You might have seen, known this was coming, I don't know. <laughs> My older brother and I shared a love for the beach, to put it mildly, especially body surfing, which our dad taught us, I think as soon as we could swim. And I remember that one summer day, hot summer day in Los Angeles where we lived, I expressed to my mom, you know, I'm really bored, what am I gonna do? And she said, thank God, she said, well, why don't you go with your brother going to surfing, board surfing? And you'll never guess the, the beach that he, one of his favorites where he took me surfing with him. It's called San Onofre. I think some of you maybe have heard of that, know about that beach. Um, well, you know where this is going, right there. <laughs> That's right, once I caught my first wave, well, that's not my first wave. Oh, okay, that's pretty close to my first wave right there. Yeah, there's two pictures. That's when I was still kind of, when I was pretty advanced there. See, I'm taking, I'm almost up walking to the nose. So that's, that's pretty good. See how, I, I was about 16 or 17 at that time. <clears throat> but as anyone who ends up surfing, you just, once I caught my first little wave and I stood up for more than probably four or five seconds, I was absolutely hooked. Someone knows what I'm talking about over here. And the point I wish to make is that I, it, surfing, I was adopting a lifestyle, not just something you do on occasion, an identity as a surfer. And I should probably add, I did not have career plans or any sense of what the future may hold. And at age 14, I had stopped attending church simply because I didn't, I knew, I probably believed there was a God, but that's as far as it went. I didn't, didn't think about God and didn't, he didn't relate to my life or, or church, really had no part in my life. Well, at age 19, I found myself facing a major crisis that shook me to the core. After dating a girl I met at a party uh, who seemed to like the beach, that's really about all we had in common. Just several months later, she came to me, announced to me one day that she was pregnant. Well, you can imagine my world fell apart. Yeah, the news shook me to the core. I was filled with fear, shame, and confusion as what to do. And I think my biggest fear, of course, initially was how in the world am I gonna tell um, tell my parents this news. I knew they would try to be understanding and caring, which they were, but still would have grieved them terribly. Well, I insisted that we had to get married, even though we hardly knew each other, except on a very surface level, basically just going to the beach and parties. And then one year after our baby son was born, she left me and took this beautiful child with her because she knew there was, there was, again, nothing to really keep us together. So now comes the miracle story. Now I get to the good part. <laughs> well, it's all good. Like Joseph, the Lord saved me by pulling me out of a deep, dark pit and set my feet on solid ground and gave to me a new purpose of living I could have never dreamed of nor imagined. 
at age 21 following a spinal fusion surgery. And uh, I always try to tell people and explain this, but if there's a doctor in the room or someone who knows, I say, oh yeah, I think I had, it's called a spondylolisthesis. <laughs> and I'm looking over at uh, Dr. Klein Handy, who maybe you all don't know that Klein was head radiologist at um, Tri-City Hospital. So you don't do, do it now, but you can correct me. That I didn't get that quite right, but he knows what, what exactly what kind of surgery and how to pronounce it correctly. But, the other thing the doctor didn't tell me before the surgery, um, I thought two weeks and then I'm back surfing, right? He walks into my room and says, the x-ray, I've looked at your x-rays, I'm gonna put you in a body cast for three months. Oh my, at age 21, <laughs> I'm gonna lose my suntan, quick here. Um, but God had his plan. God as a merciful, loving father revealed himself to me in a way that he couldn't, that he knew best how to reveal himself to me and especially knowing I was shy and all that kind of thing. So basically what happened, and to keep this short, was um, the hospital chaplain came to visit me and he told me later that he said, I was struck by how much pain I saw in your face. And I knew I was gonna come back. He asked if he'd like me to come back and see him. And I said, yeah, and I thought, what in the world are you doing? How would a minister's gonna walk in your room? But he said he was gonna come back anyway because <laughs> he was struck by the pain and the grief that he saw in me and what i experienced was compassion and understanding and no judgment and during this time the miracle happened because he brought 12 books for me to read during that time and they all had to do with the simple gospel message that god is a loving god who forgives all our sins he removes our guilt we can overcome fear through his love and overcome our inferiority complex i still like that old-fashioned freudian expression in inferiority complex with the truth that when I embrace the Lord Jesus into my life, I truly become a precious child of God. So for the first time, I experienced a real sense of hope for my future. I knew that God somehow had a plan and purpose for my life. Well, you now can probably understand why I chose the title, Identity is Everything. Because when I, by the time I left the hospital, I knew that I knew that I was indeed a beloved child, a beloved son of the Most High God. And with this knowledge, I was now open to listen to the call of God and discover his plans for my life. And so at age 29, just not that far away, um, after going to four years of seminary, uh, I was ordained as a priest in the Episcopal Church. And so now fast forward to age 81, July 13th, about two weeks ago. Don't all look real surprised. I know I look about 30. <laughs> <laughs> kind of, no, well, yeah, about that age, yeah, Joseph there. Um, but I look back in amazement at what the Lord has done, the way he has guided my life, as I'm sure Joseph did. Oh my, Joseph, look what he went through and how he ended up with the governor of all the land after, you know, from the pit to the prison, you know, we've been over that. And each one of you, I'm sure, can say the same thing and point out how you look back and see, yeah, God guided me here, he moved me here, he got me out of this problem or whatever. So a few years back, I happened, and I'm gonna uh, um, wrap it up with this. Uh, a few years back, I happened to hear, um, yeah, I was on a television program. I just sort of happened to find it. The well-known Catholic priest, Henry Nouwen. I think many of you know his books, The Wounded Healer was his probably most well-known. He was preaching at the Crystal Cathedral in Anaheim. And I thought, I wanna to listen to what this man is saying. He was up there you know, in his eighties and preaching. And I thought, what is he saying at this point in his life now that he's lived his whole life in a very amazing career, world speaker and writer and all that. What is, he, what is his message? Well, guess what his message was? <laughs> And when I, and I booked up for my sermon prep, I grabbed this book, I, I have this book, that one of his books by him called Life of the Beloved. And I went, wow, beloved, that's our identity. <laughs> and that's what he majors on in this book, uh, that, that God created us to be his beloved children and he's the beloved. And so, but that was his message. When I don't remember what he preached on, but I remember one thing, thing that he said. My takeaway, and this was quite a few years ago, he says, no matter what happens in our lives, the good things, the bad things, the hardships, the sicknesses, 
the pain, the heartache, whatever it is, there's one thing that will keep us in good stead throughout our lives. And I'm what? <laughs> if we know, and we know that we know that we are a beloved son or a beloved daughter of the living God. That was his whole message. And I just said, well, praise God. Now that's, that's what I wanted. That's my message. That's what I prayed about this. I thought, what's the one thing I wanted to share this morning on about identity? Well, of course, they, Joseph, but, but what about our identity as, as children of God? But to know that we're not just a child of God, that we're a beloved child. And I'm just gonna end with this one quote a very short one from his book, as I had this underlined years ago when I read this. This is really wonderful summary. Just You can see why he became a well-known writer. The unfathomable mystery of God is that God is a lover who wants to be loved. The one who created us is waiting for our response to the love that gave us our being. God not only says, you are my beloved, God also asks, do you love me? and offers us countless chances to say yes. That is the spiritual life, the chance to say yes to our inner truth. The spiritual life thus understood radically changes everything. Mercy changes everything. That was last week. So I'll change my title because Bill says he does that sometimes. Uh, identity as beloved children will change your life <laughs> and keep changing. So that's the message. Well, um, well, God bless you and thank you for living. And uh, I'm going to close with a prayer. And just, I think, you know, what I just went in praying this morning, I just want to remember Jesus was baptized in the River Jordan by John the Baptist. And you remember what, what did the voice say to Jesus that everyone must have heard? You are my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And I think that's if we get that. But Jesus says to that, God says the same thing to you and me through our baptism. Number one, if you're baptized into Christ, that's what happens at baptism. He pours his love in, but he says, you're my beloved child from that point on. And that's an indelible truth that you cannot change. My brother gave me a rock. It says Father Bob on it. It stuck imprinted in a rock. And I, I brought that along as my security blanket this morning. I had a rock last night. <laughs> So this one says, but when I, this is such a wonderful gift from my brother, he was always proud of me. Um, but, but the fact is in rock, it's, it's indelible. So indelibly in my soul and in Bill's soul and those of us that are ordained, not that we're any holier than you are, you all know that, but we are priests or deacons where that's indelible. You can't remove that. Well, you can't remove your, your identity as a beloved child of God. Amen. <laughs>